Now on Book TV's Afterwards, Fox News legal and political analyst Greg Jarrett offers his thoughts on the Mueller report and the investigation of Russia's interference in the 2016 election. He's interviewed by Matt Schlapp, chair of the American Conservative Union. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. It's my great honor to be here with Greg Jarrett, my friend and someone who has made me smarter. Uh, your most recent bestseller, The Witch Hunt, uh, which uh, is a fascinating read that tells us all the tales that we've been going through since 2016. This is a, a follow-on to your uh, bestseller, The Russia Hoax, uh, which was a New York Times number one bestseller. I'm sure this will be as well. <laughs> Thank You're you. You're off to the races. You're already at number three? Well, it's, I'm already at number three. It's great to be with you. Thanks, thanks for having me. So uh, when I first heard the president use the term witch hunt mm -hmm. uh, in that tweet, much like he used fake news, uh, the fact that the election could be <coughs> rigged, uh, all of these things, for people like me who have spent most of my adult life, professional life in Washington, D.C., you kind of recoil. Sure. Because they're bold phrases. Now you've, you've borrowed this phrase for your book. Why? Well, because it's very telling. What people tend to forget about witch hunts is that there are no real witches. Mm -hmm. But this overwhelming, irrational desire to believe that witches exist is what propels a witch hunt. And that's what happened here. An astonishing array of theoretically smart people convinced themselves and tens of millions of others that the president had committed the most noxious crime there is in the criminal codes treason, mm -hmm. a treasonous conspiracy with Vladimir Putin hatched in the bowels of the Kremlin to steal the 2016 election. And it was based on not a shred of credible evidence. And the book explains how now we know through testimony of those involved they never had any plausible evidence to launch the original FBI investigation in 2016. And nine months later, when the special counsel was appointed, they still had no evidence. And the appointment itself violated the regulations authorizing the appointment. And I explain how in the book. And one of the things that <clears throat> struck me as truly amazing is that the appointment was made by the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, and it wasn't based on the evidence or the law. It was based on vengeance. He named a special counsel because Rosenstein had become angry with the president. He was overwrought. He was emotional. And in an act of retaliation, he appointed Bob Mueller. So think about this, a 22-month-long national nightmare because one guy got angry and he knew what he'd done was wrong on the day of the appointment after it was announced. He's confronted in his office about what he'd done, his abuse of power, the violation of the regulations. Right. And he cowers behind his desk and he blubbers, am I going to get fired? That tells you he knew what he had done was wrong. Uh, you know, if he had gotten fired earlier, we might have uh, yeah. avoided so much of this drama. So uh, go back to this whole idea of uh, Donald Trump pre-being elected to, pres to the presidency, this relationship with Russia. I just remember, I still have flashbacks to all the interviews and stuff uh, in the run-up to the Republican nomination and then the general election in 2016. There was always this intrigue about Donald Trump was made by Russia or bailed right. out by Russia. It was like a constant theme. You couldn't, there were scant facts or even details. Well, where did this come from? It began originally with Hillary Clinton in early 2016. She began to pepper her speeches with references to Trump and Putin, that Trump might be, you know, a Kremlin marionette. Do you think she believed that or do you think she just knew it was potent politics? One of the unanswered questions is, did she get it from CIA Director John Brennan, who was already beginning to investigate Trump and any potential ties with Russia? He's described in my book as the instigator of the witch hunt. 
He put together an interagency task force that grew to be the foundation of the Russia hoax in the investigation. It was used by the FBI, and in particular, Peter Strzok, who was the head of counterintelligence for the FBI, the point person in the witch hunt. And so we don't know whether it was something that came from the rich imagination of Hillary Clinton or uh, John Brennan or both. And James Clapper was involved. He turns out to be the prodigious leaker, and I explain his leaks in the book. But it all came to a head when the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee uh, paid for Russian disinformation that was composed by an ex-British spy, Christopher Steele. And the amazing part, and I explain this in Witch Hunt, <clears throat> is that he puts together his anti-Trump dossier lickety-split within the course of 10 days to 14 days from being hired. Now, that's impossible. If you read the first memo of his dossier, um, that's the kind of information that would take months, if not years, of working human source information on the ground in Russia and so forth. He hadn't been in Russia in more than 10 years. It's almost as if he picked up the telephone, called the Kremlin, and said, give me something, anything, whether it's true or not, about Donald Trump. And I think in the end, he was simply fed Russian disinformation with little tidbits of truth, which is classic Russian disinformation. But the truth was just public information that anybody could find on the Internet. Did Christopher, Christopher <laughs> Steele or Brennan and the Obama appointees, did they use allies uh, like the Brits and others yes. to try to handle some of this in quote-unquote dark spots, places that they could kind of like wash their hands of the fact that this information was being dredged up to try to stop Trump? You know, um, the CIA, then under John Brennan, the director, they're not allowed under U.S. law to spy on American citizens. They're prohibited from that. But it's strange how they seem to be able to. Well, they did. They outsourced it to foreign governments right. and people in, in foreign countries. And they were able to lure some key people in the Trump campaign. But they were minor figures, but they regarded them as key people. Overseas, <clears throat> so that they could... Uh, feed them uh, information that could be used to justify their, their investigation. And they use confidential informants like a longtime CIA asset, a professor by the name of Stefan Halver in Great Course. Britain. And then the, the FBI, or a CIA, we're not quite sure, sends in a, a, an FBI analyst under a fake name by the name of Azra Turk, who's described as a sexy bottle blonde to seduce George Papadopoulos, who's a minor peripheral, peripheral uh, volunteer junior advisor on the Trump campaign. What they end up getting is, is not incriminating information, because there was no incriminating. What they got was exculpatory information, which was then sedulously hidden. Yeah, in the backyard. Yeah, covered it's up. Amazing how that, that works. <clears throat> but in order to understand... This um, kind of a rotten stench, I don't like saying it, that comes from a lot of law, really high up law enforcement officials in right. our government, you, you kind of have to wind the tape back and go all the way back. Oh, yeah. Not all the way back to all the Clinton scandals, because that's a long tape, but just the, the Hillary Clinton, the Benghazi, uh, real tragedy, yeah. th her decision to keep servers uh, in, in the bathroom of their home, her decision to have a, an outside the normal government process to have, collect emails and data, um, all of that, which obviously uh, becomes quite a scandal as Mueller, as the FBI director, has to, excuse me, Comey as the FBI director, has to go through and figure out, okay, right. how do I handle all of this scandal? Um, you have to go back there because... Right. In reading your book again, I felt like I lived every moment of that. But in reading it again, it's quite extraordinary. Oh, it is. The result of all of that. Could you yeah. tell, tell the listeners the story? of? Well, Chapter 1 is entitled A Tale of Two Cases, and it compares the Clinton 
investigation to the Trump investigation. And it demonstrates the disparity of treatment, the unequal uh, prosecution and, and justice that is dif- dispensed not based on the law, but, but based on politics and partisanship. So she's never sworn in in any of this process? No. Um, so it, the, the bottom line is that Hillary Clinton committed multiple acts uh, that constitute felonies. Um, it's abundantly clear. You know, she had a private server. It's a violation of the Espionage Act. Uh, classified information is stored in her home. And for people who say, um, well, but, but James Comey said there's no similar case that somebody has been prosecuted for that. I name all the individuals right. that have been prosecuted for exactly what Hillary Clinton did. So when Comey stood up and said no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case, that's just not true. Reasonable prosecutors had brought innumerable cases. Comey knew what Clinton did was a crime, multiple crimes. In fact, 110 crimes representing 110 classified documents stored in her home. And he actually wrote a statement two months before she's even interviewed, and 17 other key people are even interviewed. And in it, he he uses the language of the Espionage Act. She was grossly negligent. But then he presents that statement to his staff and says, but I still want to clear her. And the staff, you know, says, well, you can't clear her if you just found her guilty of a crime under the Espionage Act. So they, a pivotal date occurs in which Peter Strzok sits down at his computer with his lover, Lisa Page, standing over his shoulder, and he eliminates the incriminating words, uh, grossly negligent, and and substitute something that is actually under the law identical and synonymous, but it sounds different and it's not in the criminal code, extremely careless, which had been borrowed from Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And based on that, he cleared Hillary Clinton. He twisted the facts and contorted the law to clear her. And doesn't he later say that he was ordered to do that? Yes. By... Uh, by the Department of Justice, headed up by Loretta Lynch, who uh, just before Comey clears Clinton, meets on a tarmac in a plane with Bill Clinton. But, yeah, they're just talking about, you know, grandkids and golf and and so forth. And she owes much of her success in her career, I'm sure, to her own abilities, but also to being viewed as a close ally of Bill Clinton. Clinton. Sure. I mean, he elevated her, uh, and she eventually became the attorney general, but he advanced her career. Um, She then pretends to recuse herself from the case, but she doesn't actually recuse herself from the case. You know, um, there are people who don't like the Clintons, didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, who really uh, get into the whole dynamics of this story. We obviously have a lot of people watching the show who are Clinton supporters who think that, well, maybe a story with a, uh, a book with the title Witch Hunt might uh, want to just bring out the worst of what Hillary Clinton did. I, I would happen to believe there's a lot to write about in terms of that. Yeah. But why does it matter? So she breaks she breaks the Espionage Act. She says she does this but for a matter of convenience. We can all understand that. We have our devices, and it's nice when it's more convenient instead of less convenient. Right. Why was it a problem to keep her emails vulnerable? It jeopardized national security. So, as I explain um, in the book, documents subsequent to her being cleared demonstrated that foreign countries obtained her emails. And that's come through in the testimony yes. after the fact. And, and in uh, and classified documents as well. And so that jeopardizes our national security. That's the whole purpose of the Espionage Act. Um, you know, uh, so when when President Trump, before he was president, on the campaign said maybe China, yeah, could give us did. the emails. His point was, she says she deleted the emails. There's no record of these emails, but it's a fact that our enemies read the emails. They probably have copies yeah. of the emails. It actually was, it was ironic, yeah. tragic, <laughs> but maybe truthful that they had copies. Oh, they of those did. Emails. He he was actually referring to to Russia. If you have her missing, oh, it was emails. Russia. That's right. Yeah, yeah, if you have her missing emails. No. Let us know. Um, it was obviously said in jest, but um, it turns out that it was likely true that some of the hacked emails ended up in Russian hands because they were hacked through a Russian server. 
Um, do you think the, the other piece of this that I think is hard for people who support the Clintons and voted for Hillary Clinton is, Greg, so what? So this was about hot yoga and wedding plans and where we're going to meet for dinner. Yeah. Do you, with all the research you did, and this is quite an extensive research project, it, you know, are there indications that actually the emails were destroyed because there were sensitive yeah. conversations about things like Benghazi and things she, as a, as a candidate for the highest office in the land, it would have been politically damaging and people known? Yes. Well, it, um, she wasn't entirely successful in destroying the 33,000 emails that um, that by itself would be obstruction of justice because Congress had asked her to preserve it. Right. And, you know, when you defy Congress with a subpoena uh, attached to it, uh, that, you know, that's obstruction of so, justice. So she literally just show. said the other week that they weren't under subpoena. She kind of reprimanded the president for They're, tweeting out that they were. Did she destroy these emails after Congress had made it very clear they wanted to see them? Congress had sent in writing a request to preserve evidence. So that's sufficient whether there's a subpoena or not. A subpoena right. was forthcoming at that, at that point, but that's still obstruction of justice. It turns out that some of the uh, emails she destroyed turned up elsewhere, and some of them contained very sensitive uh, government information. So it wasn't yoga and, you know, wedding plans. Are they all public? Not all, no. So, you know, her explanation is simply untrue. Um, and yet, in addition to violating the Espionage Act, and the evidence is overwhelming that she did, you know, she, she destroyed documents that Congress had demanded. And, uh, you know, when you receive a pre preservation letter, you, you got to abide by it. Well, not only that, I'm a former government official. Sure. My wife uh, has just recently left a government service. This is her second go-round. Um, you know, you have an obligation to retain records that's explained yes. to you on your very first day on the job. So you don't actually don't need a letter from Congress or from an IG or anyone to notify you that you should keep records. You're told immediately yes. that you have to keep those records. And the reason is because when you work... Uh, for an administration or in a cabinet, as a cabinet secretary, the secretary of state, my lord, every day is history. And the taxpayer has a right uh, to be able to have a process whereby everyone gets to see that information right. because it's part of our history. The foundation of democracy is transparency and accountability. And under the Federal Records Act, anything you do in writing in the course and scope of your employment as a public official is not your property. It's a government and the American people's property. Um, there was nothing on Hillary Clinton's State Department email account. Empty. Zero. Everything she did in the course and scope of her employment was kept in her home on a private server. And as I mentioned, that's a, you know, you're jeopardizing national security, but she's also violating federal law. And she signed a document on her first day in office as Secretary of State saying, I understand these rules. Um, she received a tutorial on, here's the law, you must follow it. She signed actually two separate documents, uh, ad acknowledging it and saying, I will abide by it. But she already knew that uh, from her service in the United States Senate, having received the same instructions about how you have to preserve documents and you cannot jeopardize national security by leaking them. So, And as First Lady as well. Yes, yeah, she well knew the rules, but she ignored them with impunity because she felt she was above the law and that the rules just don't apply to her. So uh, you're a lawyer. What's your legal background? Well, I was a defense attorney uh, for uh, many years in San Francisco. Um, There's and, a lot of people to defend out there. Yes. <laughs> And most of my clients are still behind bars. But uh, <laughs> that's a lawyer joke. Yeah, it's a lawyer joke. Uh, I've taught law in law school. My but. point is, is that you look if you look at this black letter law, you know, you sign the document, which as Hillary Clinton herself, an Ivy League educated lawyer, you know what the document is saying. Yeah. You've been through several different, very senior government jobs. You understand the concept of records because there's a Clinton library that overhangs sure. the, the 
the river there in Little Rock. They know all about records because they have a whole museum that houses them. Right. Um, you don't get to pick and choose what those records are. Um, if, the, if it's Hillary with a different surname, what, what kind of legal penalties would someone face? Uh, inevitable uh, issued by a grand jury. I mean, it would, and frankly, it's a slam. Loretta Lynch <laughs> knows this, and sure. James Comey knows this. Yes. So what, what intervenes, as you said, to, to, to make that stop? You believe it stopped at Loretta Lynch just saying over to the FBI, hey, we're not going, we're not going to prosecute this. This is a matter. This isn't an investigation. We know that, that t- former top officials at the FBI, but who were there at the time all of this unfolded, testified behind closed doors. That testimony has since been released. Very few journalists have actually read it. I dug through it all. I mean, you're talking, you know, thousands of pages of, of testimony. But, for example, um, you know, Lisa Page at the FBI admitted under oath that they were told by the Department of Justice that no charges were going to be brought against Hillary Clinton. And, you know, so, uh, you know, Comey stood in front of cameras and said, the Department of Justice doesn't know what I'm about to do. Yeah, they knew. They were directing it. So uh, a lot of people believe that nothing like this really could have happened without the president, the vice president being aware of that. In your research, you couldn't find any proof of that. No. People have to just surmise how high up the food chain this went. Well, um, as I lay out the facts in in the book Witch Hunt, um, when the change in Comey's exoneration statement was made to clear her, first implicating her, then clearing her. And he seemed pretty upset about that publicly. Yeah. Not emotional, but it, it seemed like he was fitful. Right. Because it was strange wording, and he was uncomfortable, and he was being so aggressive. He was. With his language. Um, It it all came to uh, an interview that Barack Obama had had done several months before, actually on Fox News, but he'd given another one, too, and said pretty much the same thing. This was a, a sort of a public instruction, I don't want Hillary Clinton to be prosecuted. He said that what she'd done was... Uh, careless. Well, that's the language that Comey uh, eventually adopted right. after finding she was in violation of the law, gross negligence. You don't think that the FBI director would actually listen to what the words the president used? <laughs> he, he did. In fact, he told the inspector general when he was interviewed that he paid close attention to what Barack Obama had said. Obama had said, oh, she's just careless and it didn't jeopardize national security. It's exactly what Comey ended up saying on July 5th, uh, 2016, when he cleared her. So he was adopting not just uh, the language of President Obama, but essentially, you know, a public order. So it uh, might be an unfair question, but do you think Barack Obama sent every uh, signal he could to make sure that Hillary Clinton got a pass on her illegality? I, his His method was actually quite... Uh, clever and ingenious. Um, There's going to be no paper trail. I'm not going to tell people at the Department of Justice or the FBI what to do. But I'm going to go on television and tell everybody what to do. Right. And they'll hear it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So then the story really takes a dastardly turn. Uh, First of all, the Clinton Incorporated, as I like to call them, all these various aspects of the Clinton world, um, they're on defense. She's committed crimes. Right. She has to get herself out of this. There's this terrible tragedy in Benghazi. She has kind of disastrous uh, testimony up on the Hill um, where it's not about the victims. It's kind of about her. Congress, uh, with a Republican majority in the House, goes through various iterations of investigations of Benghazi. Right. In the last investigation, which Democrats were howling over how many investigations you're going to have, they actually find the evidence of these servers and such. How many investigations did they have in the House? Some five or oh, six? Oh, yeah. Or? I mean, there, there were multiple dueling investigations going on at the same time. Trey Gowdy's investigation was probably uh, the foremost. But had it not been for the deceptions uh, by Hillary Clinton and the State Department about Benghazi, we would have never discovered uh, these 
this private server in right. which you know hundreds of thousands of emails and classified documents were, were stored in but her home. The dastardly turn, it seems to me, is that uh, the folks that you chronicle in the book at the FBI, uh, predominantly, but Mr. Brennan uh, and folks in the intelligence community, switch then and go on offense. At some point in this process, yeah, they, they decide do. that to quote uh, uh, Peter Strzok, we have to stop him, or we're going to stop him, meaning Trump. Uh, they take extraordinary measures uh, to try to dig up dirt oh, overseas, right. specifically with Russia, to kind of push it towards the Clinton campaign to make the idea of voting for Donald Trump a repugnant thing for voters. How did that possibly happen? Well, there were two parts to the plan. Um, part number one was to exploit the dossier, which had been penned by Christopher Steele, um, that the FBI was unable to verify. They tried mightily, but they couldn't. Well, you can't verify something that doesn't exist, that is simply a lie, a pernicious lie. Um, but part A of the plan was to leak it to the media. And they assumed that the media would run crazy with the story, it would damage Trump politically, and ensure Hillary Clinton's election in November of 2016. And while it's true that many members of the media did pick up on the story, it didn't quite gain traction and resonate with American voters, and Trump was elected. But the insurance policy was Plan B. The insurance policy, famous from the Peter Strzok, Lisa Page text message, you know, we have an insurance policy. The insurance policy was the FBI's investigation that if Trump, Donald Trump won, um, we would kick it into overdrive and really yeah. go after him and make our investigation of him as a, you know, potential or alleged Russian asset public. So, and they did. In fact, they did it uh, in January of 2017 before he was even sworn into office. Comey, Clapper, Brennan, you know, concocted this plan to ambush Trump at Trump Tower, selectively give him information about the dossier, gauge his reaction, and use that meeting as a pretext to leak it to the media. And that's how the dossier was published. And once it was published, the media was off to the races with the Russia hoax. It seemed to me also the troubling part of that um, uh, is, you know, anybody who works for a president, there are times when you have to explain sensitive information. It's hard to do, you know, with the leader of the free world. Yeah. But it seemed in this case they, they were almost using his leverage and blackmail over the president. Like oh, we have, well, they were. We have a lot of information on you. Um, and I don't think we don't know it. Yes. And uh, that seems to be... Very uh, Hoover-esque. It really was. It really was. And we really thought that those days were over, which has me... One final question before we go into, like, the FBI and the consequences on that piece of the story is uh, in all the dossier that we've read about and read and watched all of the in-depth uh, reporting on and everything else, in all of this work that... Uh, that the Hillary Clinton campaign, Perkins Coie, uh, the deep state, <laughs> all these things that we've come to know. Is there any truth to any of these things in the, that in the, Donald Trump did, had any kind of illegal actions with no. Russia? And any, are, there, are there any truths in the dossier about things that are just embarrassing for no. President Trump? No. Um, all of the collusion allegations in the dossier turned out to be untrue. And, and you can read it in volume one of the Mueller report, um, the FBI created a spreadsheet of all of the collusion allegations, um, and it all turned up empty. There was nothing on the spreadsheet. They couldn't vet or corroborate or, or prove anything. As Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier, said, the information he wrote is unverifiable because it came <laughs> from, you know, multiple anonymous hearsay uh, you know, hearsay is generally not allowed in a court of law. Uh, double hearsay is never allowed because it's a farce. And this this was triple and quadruple hearsay. 
And we learned uh, in subsequent <laughs> testimony and with uh, uh, emails and such that were passed uh, along within the FBI that Steele himself, by these uh, characters in the Obama administration, was actually viewed by the end as an unsavory character. Oh, totally. He, in fact, he got fired by right? the FBI for lying. He was on the payroll. That of the, seems to be a trend, which is oh, yeah. we got to get into. He was on the payroll not just of the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee. He was on the payroll of the FBI and had been since early 2016, the year of the election. Um, but he lied to the FBI uh, about talking to the media and feeding this disinformation to the media. And too many people in the FBI found out about it, and they had to fire him. But they still used him. Comey goes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to get a warrant application to spy on the Trump campaign. And, and he vouches for Steele as credible, knowing he wasn't. He was a liar. His internal communications at the time yes. proved di that, that Comey felt differently about Steele, that knew he was unsavory, yeah. knew that he had lied to him. Right. And so, you know, it, it, the, the State Department, Kathleen Cadillac, who's this officer at the State Department, met at one point before the FISA applications to spy with Christopher Steele. And she sized him up in the course of about an hour and, and realized he was a phony. And she checked out at least one major part of his dossier. And it, it, it was some consulate in Florida that didn't even exist. And so she notifies the FBI and the Department of Justice, hey, this guy's a fraud, you, you know, be careful here. They ignored that warning and went ahead to the judges at the FISA court and lied to them and deceived them and concealed evidence. And it wasn't just the State Department that warned the FBI. Bruce Orr at the Department of Justice, who was the conduit for the dossier information and giving it to the FBI, warned them that be careful of this information. It's totally unverified. The FBI and James Comey and Andrew McCabe didn't care. You know, the FISA warrant application has at the top verified information. Right. Yet they relied on the dossier, which was unverified. Now, you know, that's last time I checked, lying to a, a judge is, is a fraud on the court. And as I explained in Witch Hunt, um, it's also five other, other different potential felonies. When the inspector general report um, comes out, I expect it to be a damning indictment of the actions of these people, especially with the deceptions of the FISA court. I uh, worked for President George W. Bush. I was involved with some of the meetings around selecting Bob Mueller to be uh, the FBI director for the president. Um, I went to Bob Mueller's swearing in on the uh, in the Rose Garden. I mm -hmm. brought my mother really? and one of her wonderful friends from Wichita, uh, Mary Lou Tinker. We have great photos from the occasion. I remember the meetings. I'm not saying anything inappropriate here, but I remember in, as they were looking for candidates, the one thing you heard over and over again about Bob Mueller, this is once again the Bush administration during his time when he's FBI director, is he is the quintessentially perfect candidate to be the FBI director. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it true then, and if it was if it was or wasn't true, when did the FBI get on this most dangerous of rogue paths? Did it start with Mueller? Did it start before Mueller? Is it really a Comey-Obama problem? What, what happened inside it, the FBI? It started before Mueller, but then it escalated after... Uh, using any power they could yes. because they're the good guys, they're right. the G-men, they're, they're, they have the white hats right. so they can do these things. They are the truly uh, you know, right. elites that can right. break the rules in the interests of the country. The reason I say it, it, it began before Mueller is because right after Mueller was appointed FBI director around the time of, of 9-11, um, he gets hauled in front of the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the secret Star Chamber Court. And they confront him with uh, evidence that the FBI had for years been presenting lies to the FISA court uh, in warrant applications to spy. 
And Mueller promised that uh, he would fix it, institute new rules and procedures. He actually did. It's called the Woods Procedures. But the FBI continued to violate the Woods Procedures, particularly uh, in this particular case in, in the investigation of Donald Trump and the surveillance and spying on Carter Page. So it predates Mueller, but it continued under his leadership, and then it really escalated under James Cummings. So once again, with my experience in the Bush administration, that's the first time James Comey was considered uh, as a real candidate to come to Maine Justice, um, I believe, to come as the DAG. And um, we did a little checking on Jim Comey. It wasn't a name I'm, I was familiar with, and yeah. I'm not a lawyer. But most of the checking we did, um, you know, he was a bit of a, politi- at least politically, a chameleon. Yeah. You know, people would, you know, he would tell us he loved President Bush and he really loved his <laughs> policies. But then you would talk to liberals and they would say, oh, James Comey is kind of secretly one of us. He's actually pretty liberal on everything. He's, he's a political foe of President Bush's. So you kind of got this hodgepodge story and one person who knew him well summarized him well by saying what the best thing to know about James Comey is he's about James Comey yeah you know and I saw it early on when he was a U.S. attorney back in the 1990s and I attended a news conference that he held about uh, some case that he had launched I remember my cameraman walked out with me to the van uh, after the news conference, he said, wow, have you ever seen a guy who loves himself that much? Um, And I always remember that because I I then saw it vividly uh, in in my research for the case and following the case, writing columns. James Cummings, I describe in the book as this vainglorious, sanctimonious, self-righteous individual um, who only cares about James Cummings. That was that was our experience, and if you think back during every one of those major jobs he had, he always turns yeah. on the person who picks him. He ended up turning on President Bush oh, yeah. at the end of the administration on sensitive questions about renewal of kind of Patriot Act uh, and 9-11 era legislation. Uh, he obviously, uh, this whole Hillary Clinton thing, back and forth, opening the investi- reopening the investigation sure. right before right. the election day, completely infuriating all the kind of Obama, Clinton folks. Like, what is he doing? Um, it, to this day, now he really has the, um, the social media uh, presence of, a, of an almost AOC acolyte. It's yeah. Like he's a, he's a, you know, a warrior in the communist revolution. It's like it's... It's amazing, metamorphosis. Yeah, I mean, it's rather nauseous, you know, when he tweets out, you know, standing by the sea in some philosophical phrase he uses, or standing among the tall trees and so forth. Um, you know, you, it's actually pretty comical. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, he didn't say standing behind the curtains, <laughs> yeah. standing among the trees. Standing among the trees. You know, James Comey is a guy who lied to the president repeatedly, telling him, you're, you're not being investigated. The truth was, and the documents show, and the testimony shows, he was. He was lying to the president. It's really one of the reasons, in addition to the mishandling of Hillary Clinton case, that Trump fired him, because he, Trump knew he, that Comey was just lying to him all the time. At one point, Comey uh, delivers testimony before Congress, and it becomes apparent to Trump that, geez, the guy's been lying to me for the last several months which was the final straw, and he, and, he, and he fired James Comey. Then Comey, who had told the president, I don't leak, I don't do sneaky things, uh, steals government documents, not his property, it's government property, and leaks them to a friend for the purpose of leaking them to the media to trigger the appointment of the special counsel. It just happens to be his longtime friend, colleague, and mentor, Bob Mueller. So that's how devious James Comey is. And when he gets caught in a lot of these things, he, um, he feigns memory loss, uh, as he did in his testimony. I think he said 149 times. I don't remember. I, you know, gee. And in interviews when confronted, he, he pretends that he, he doesn't know things. The dossier? 
I'm not quite sure I know what that is. Christopher Steele, I know I've heard that name before. I mean, those kinds of answers that really makes you uh, seriously doubt the credibility of Comey. So if Jim Comey is someone that really brings rack and ruin, certainly to the reputation of the FBI, that's undeniable. But then you have this question about the policies, using your power uh, to stop Trump, to push this Russia hoax. What? Who hires Andy McCabe to be the deputy in all this <laughs> process? Like, how does the cast of characters around James Comey come together? Is that his doing? Is it an internal process where it was just kind of inevitable? Because how do all these people with left-wing politics and animus mm-hmm. uh, towards a duly elected president, how do they all get into the upper echelon. That can't happen by anything other than purpose. Comey surrounded himself with sycophants, and it didn't matter their qualifications. So uh, I've talked to several former top FBI officials who said uh, McCabe was not qualified to be deputy FBI director and then eventually, upon the firing of Comey, acting FBI director. Even even though we are all, I have a spouse that's involved in politics, there's a lot of people right. in 21st century America that have that. But even this question of having a spouse that's so politically active yes. in the Commonwealth of Virginia, even that people, you would think IGs and lawyers would say, right. you know, the optics of that aren't great. Yes, and he should have recused himself. And he eventually did, but it was too late. It was at the very end. Um I I opened Chapter 4 entitled The Attempted Coup by observing that Rod Rosenstein and Andrew McCabe are are living proof of the Peter principle, (laughs) that that people in a hierarchy tend to rise to the level of their own incompetence. And that's true of both Rod Rosenstein and uh, Andrew McCabe. But to answer your initial question, I mean, the people that Comey surrounded himself with um, were, as I say, you know, sick offense. But they're all on the same page. Um, not that they're terribly qualified to do what they're doing, but these are people um, who believed in James Comey and that were willing to do anything, even undermine the rule of law and subvert the democratic process, which is what they did. So uh, you go forward in this process. Donald Trump is struggling to get this whole idea of collusion with Russia uh, behind him. It must be, must just be de- bedeviling to keep having this come forward and go yeah. forward and all these stories and everything else. Tell the story of the reemergence of Bob Mueller, who my, from my understanding of having conversations with people who would know, uh, was actually maybe some would say in the hunt uh, to be Donald Trump's director of the FBI, FBI after James Comey is let go. Yeah, I I wrote a column recently that that posed the question: Did did Mueller lie to Congress when he denied that he was interviewing uh, to be FBI director again uh, with President Trump in the Oval Office the very day before he becomes special counsel? Right. Um, documents show that uh, Rosenstein, who appointed Mueller, and Mueller were secretly communicating that Mueller was already on board to be the special counsel. So what was he doing then uh, in the Oval Office the day before he takes the job? Now, he denied he was interviewing for FBI directorship, but I interviewed the president in the Oval Office, and he said absolutely he was. That's why he was there. I interviewed his personal assistant who set up the meeting and was privy to the conversation. I said, yeah, it was an interview to be FBI director. Multiple administration witnesses and documents demonstrate that Mueller was either terribly mistaken or or not telling the truth um, when he denied all of that. But it invites the question, so what's he doing there? If he's already decided to take the job as special counsel, why is he in the Oval Office? Was that a conversation under false pretenses so that Mueller could gather information from Trump in the Oval Office to be used against him in the special counsel investigation. And the key question is, did the president explain to Mueller his reasons for firing Comey? And if the answer to that question is yes, then 
Mueller could not have served as special counsel because that makes him both prosecutor and witness in the same case, which is strictly prohibited. So I put the question to the president when I interviewed him just a couple of months ago for the book. I said, did you tell Mueller your reasons for firing James Comey? And the president paused and he thought about it and, and he smiled and he, and he said, uh, no comment. He says, I could tell you the answer because I know the answer and I vividly remember the conversation. Um, and as I write in the book, um, the, it was clear to me, sitting across from the president, judging his reaction to my question and his demeanor, that the answer was yes. I mean, it's inconceivable that they wouldn't have talked about the firing of James Comey just days before because Trump had been talking to everybody about it. Yeah. So again... Mueller should never have been special counsel. He was a fact witness, and he, and he wasn't honest with the president. He didn't say to the president, by the way, Mr. President, I've agreed to be a special counsel to investigate you. He wasn't forthright. He wasn't honest and truthful to the president, which to me is unconscionable. So the Mueller to Comey to Rosenstein bring back Mueller if we look through all of this uh, kind of parade of characters, in the meantime, the FBI has taken quite a black eye, which I don't think either one of us or any Americans really like saying. The FBI is an awfully important instrument of our government, a much needed um, agency in our government. Um, do you think they're on the path to recovery? Do you think they're... No, no, because um, Comey's twin brother is the FBI director. I'm saying that metaphorically, um, Christopher Wray. Um, and I don't think, to me, judging the actions of Chris Wray since he's been FBI director demonstrates that he doesn't care about uh, transparency and unspooling the truth to the American people. He, he cares about covering up to protect the FBI. How do I know that? Because he has defied lawful subpoenas issued by Congress. He has fought the declassification of critical documents that would expose the truth behind the witch hunt. So, you know, it's a shame that Christopher Wray um, can't be more honest and forthcoming and transparent to the American people. They need to know the truth. They deserve the truth. Accountability in a democracy is fundamental. Jim Clapper, uh, John Brennan... These are two names that appear throughout the book, and we've all had to read and, and watch their roles in all this. Right. Can they be prosecuted? Uh, is, is that a live wire? Should they be? Oh, I think it's possible. Um, and that's why it, it's very significant and important that William Barr, several months ago, um, launched a, an official Department of Justice investigation and appointed U.S. Attorney from Connecticut, John Durham, to head it up. Durham is well-versed in corruption at the FBI and the CIA. He's prosecuted and put behind bars um, people who have engaged in lawless acts in those agencies. And, uh, you know, as I write in the book, it's inventing a lie is easy, spreading the lie is easier. Uncovering the truth is hard because the truth always has its enemies. And it will take time to unravel all of the lawlessness and corrupt acts involved in the witch hunt. Um, but I, I have confidence in William Barr and John Durham. Um, the inspector general's report will be very important, but they're not waiting for the IG report. They're moving full steam ahead. And in fact, we recently learned that Durham has expanded his investigation, added additional personnel, which suggests to me that he likely has already found evidence of potential crimes. The, uh, what's amazing uh, when you read the book and you recollect this amazing path this country's, our country's been on, it seemed like during the Obama years, nothing leaked <laughs> from this group. We put in air quotes, the deep state, the people in the intelligence communities who know real dirt on us and our, and our enemies overseas. They have real information. 
and nothing on the Hillary Clinton emails, right. nothing on trying to stop him, to quote Peter Strzok. Yeah, it's amazing. Nothing leaked, but yet with President Trump, there is a delicious leak, including conversations with foreign leaders and others, on a very regular basis throughout his whole presidency. Why is that asymmetry allowed to... Because for the eight years of the Barack Obama administration, the intelligence community, the FBI, they were all empowered. You know, um, this small group of unelected but powerful officials, you call it the deep state, so do others. I call it a malignant force. They saw Donald Trump coming, and he was a threat to the perpetuation of their power. Hillary Clinton would have been a third term of Barack Obama. Their power would continue. But Donald Trump, remember, vowed to drain the swamp. They're the swamp, the malignant force. They didn't want to be drained. Uh, power in Washington is like crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, once you, you, you get on it and you have it, you don't want to give it up and you will do anything to stop someone who's going to take your power away from you. And so that's how the Russia hoax began. That's how it begat the witch hunt is because these people saw Donald Trump as a threat to themselves and what they loved, power. And the end justified any means, even lawless means. So you've you written two books on this whole tragedy since 2016, but it doesn't seem to end. You have to end your book. <laughs> but well, the whole dynamic keeps going. I end the book. Do you um, journal every day getting ready for the next book? Because it's like, I'm, you better be taking good notes because it's not stopping. I'm not inclined to write another book. But, you know, the only cure for a lie is the truth. And the only remedy for lawlessness is justice. And I end with that and then say, a reckoning awaits. And so we wait. Um, I follow it, obviously, very carefully. I continue to write columns um, on the subject matter. Um, so we'll wait and see. And I'm as curious as the American public is to see whether or not um, people will be held accountable because, you know, nobody's above the law, but nobody's below the law either. And, and Trump was treated as if he's below the law. For example, he was accused of obstruction of justice constantly with no crimes because he he dared to speak out that the investigation against him was wrong and that he hadn't done anything wrong he wasn't obstructing justice he was protesting an injustice mm -hmm. under the law that's not obstruction of justice and yet you know the 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 Mueller team thought that just criticizing them and their investigation was obstruction of justice. Um, as one of the lawyers, as I recount in the book, said, they, they acted like crybabies, that, that no one, not even the president, can exercise a First Amendment right to say, what you're doing is wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. It's a witch hunt. And it, it was a witch hunt. But now we know. Uh, in the moments we have, the minutes we have left... Um Tell us a little more about your career, your path to uh, chronicle these uh, these amazing stories that are truthful um, in your in your two books. Uh, how did you get to this point? Well, I, I was a lawyer, a defense attorney, um, a great many years ago. I accidentally fell into TV, and I did uh, local news for another. How, how did you fall into TV? Well. Um, you know, a buddy of mine was auditioning for a morning TV job, and I tagged along, and I ended up auditioning. And they liked you better. Yeah. He's still my friend, by the way. <laughs> did he fall into TV? No, he, did. he had a wonderful <laughs> career doing other things. But um, so I, I did both for many years, and it became too much. And I was young and uh, single and didn't have a mortgage. And I thought, well, I'll just take a sabbatical. Uh, from uh, the law firm where I worked in San Francisco. And uh, um, after a couple of years, uh, the firm said, uh, you're still on the letterhead. Are, is this sabbatical ever going to end? <laughs> That's awesome. 
So, uh, you know, I did local news. I did core TV for yeah. several years. I was at MSNBC. I was an anchor at Fox News for 15 years. But I started writing columns. Right. And the columns sort of took off. So I asked Fox, you know, I'd, I'd like to give up the anchoring because it's a conflict of interest. And so I've been, the columns led to two books. And uh, I'm a Wichita boy. You spent some time in Wichita. I met my wife in Wichita. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. I anchored the news. That and means she is fantastic, by she the way. Is, <laughs> she's, she, she wasn't born and raised in Wichita. Yeah. She's from Dallas, Texas. But we met in Wichita. She was living there. I was living there. I loved Wichita. I, I had a great time there. And uh, the people are so nice. And, um, you know, uh, I, I fondly regard Wichita and have been back uh, several times and always enjoy visiting. Do you go back? I do. My mother was just here from Wichita. And was she? Brothers and sisters come out. So, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, as we bring this to a, a conclusion, obviously, um, your experience out there in the country, right, uh, with these different uh, media jobs you've had, yeah. does that help give you a perspective oh, on totally these questions does. of politics? I mean, when you live with the people of Kansas, the people of North Carolina, as I did, uh, people in Maryland. I anchored the news there as well. I mean, you really get a feel for the uh, the honesty of America and what people care about. Um, you become kind of a part of them. It was one of the great things of, of being a correspondent for several years is I, I, I think I went to just about every state. I haven't been to Alaska. But you get to know people, and um, it, keeps you, it keeps you grounded and honest because they're honest. And uh, it's an important part of being a reporter, I think, is to understand who your readers are and your viewers are and your listeners. Greg Jarrett, a good man. The book is Witch Hunt. Everyone should go buy it. Matt. And we appreciate you being our guest here today. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's fun.